Hello and welcome back to another video on the True Footy YouTube channel. Guys, continuing with some draft content with a bit of a different look today. We are going to be taking a look at the 2022 draft, 12 months on, and doing a redraft based on what we've learned so far in 2023 about these respective players. Now, this one's a little tricky one. This isn't so much about ranking the players on what we've seen so far. It's trying to get into the mind of recruiters. If the draft was redone today, what the order would actually be. And I've tried to take into account factors such as what the team's needs are, as well as you know what type of player a player is. For instance, if they're key position and they haven't necessarily even played yet, I'm not gonna discount it too hard. But there have been players that really surprised us in 2023, and uh, I've done the top 20, and it does have a very different feel to it in my personal opinion. So a couple of factors that I've ignored, okay? First of all, um, the go-home factor around someone like a Harry Sheasel, I've ignored it for this video. I've also ignored the value of uh, academy pick points so that I didn't take into account whether Brisbane could match two bids for Jasper Fletcher if they happen to be earlier than they were last year. I've ignored all that. But I've had a crack at plotting the top 20 uh, based on what we've seen so far. And in my personal opinion, I thought the first handful of picks were fairly easy and fairly straightforward. And then around six to about 15, that's where it got very, very even. And I do remember this draft being pretty even amongst, you know, certainly the, the midfielders of this draft. It was very hard to separate them. And I think that's going to cause a lot of um, discontent in the comment section. I feel like it's been a while since I've really been roasted for a video. I feel like we've got a good thing going on in current form, but potentially I'm going to ruin all of that momentum uh, with this video. And I feel like it might be divisive, but I do like to live dangerously sometimes. So bring it on. So let's kick things off with the first selection of this year's draft, GWS hold it. And like I said, I'm ignoring go home factor here. So it's a, it's a tough one. Do they bid on Will Ashcroft or do they take Harry Sheasel outright? That was the decision making that I had going through this video. And I've decided they're gonna select Harry Sheasel at pick one of this year's draft again. He had a wonderful year. He won the Rising Star. Will Ashcroft would have been a really good shot for it. Uh, he only played 11 games, uh, but Sheasel played the entire year. He averaged 27 touches a game. Not only did he win the Rising Star, but he won North Melbourne's best and fairest too. So pretty hard to argue with that. You could easily go Ashcroft bid on a pick one. It's pretty tight, but I prefer Sheasel. Then just like in real life, uh, North Melbourne are on the clock and they will bid on Will Ashcroft, which is matched by the Brisbane Lions. So Will Ashcroft stays at pick two. Like I said, he could have easily gone pick one. Uh, he played 11 games this year for about 22 touches a game before getting injured. The argument for Will Ashcroft over Sheasel would be that he probably played a harder role, uh, genuinely in the midfield there and won plenty of his own ball as well. And I'm not saying he's necessarily gonna be a better player, but I'd probably go Sheasel just because he's a bit more of a game breaker. So now we're down to North Melbourne at pick three and the actual guy who went here, I just took a pick one. So I'm gonna double down for them and I'm gonna take George Wardlaw, one actual pick before he was taken. They actually took him at pick four. Uh, but George Wardlaw looks to be like an elite midfield talent to me. He's battled hamstring injuries both in his draft here and this year he only managed the eight games but he did win a rising star nomination in that time he won four clearances a game for a young inside mid to show what he showed even though he only averaged the 15 disposals I think there's real top end potential there so North Melbourne double down on George Wardlaw which means a pick four again I'm considering need here I think North Melbourne could easily go a key forward and that's where they'll take the actual number one pick from this year's draft in Aaron Cadman now Cadman hasn't really done anything wrong he's played uh, 12 games this year kicked six goals whatever he's a key forward we you give him a mulligan for relatively low output. He did play pretty well in the VFL and does look like a very good key forward prospect. But I think what Harry Sheasel showed this year demonstrated that he would probably go pick one or two over Aaron Cadman. And Aaron Cadman uh, will join the North Melbourne Football Club at pick four. At pick five, this this is where it gets a little bit more even uh, for a little while, to be honest. And uh, Essendon's on the clock. They did take Elijah Sardis originally with his pick. But I've got them nabbing Bailey Humphrey from the Gold Coast Suns, who was originally pick six, one pick later to the Gold Coast Suns. Um, he won a Rising Star nomination for his round nine performance. He played 19 games, averaged uh, 11 disposals and kicked 11 goals for the year. But I think his game-breaking ability, his dynamic nature, that's probably what makes him stand out amongst the other prospects. And we saw him impact the game at AFL level pretty early, to be honest. So I think Essendon go Bailey Humphrey at this pick. At pick six, I've got the Gold Coast Suns. Again, they, they originally took Bailey Humphrey, so they've got to pick someone else. Uh, this is where I'm going to lose a lot of you, I reckon. But I am going to put on my blue and gold glasses, and I say Elijah Hewitt. Elijah Hewitt was originally pick 14. Um, that was a little bit of a slide compared to where he was throughout the middle of the year. I don't expect many people to have watched Eagles games as neutrals and see what I see with Elijah Hewitt, but I see genuine top level a-grade midfield ability. He won a Rising Star nomination in round 22 and his back end of the year was really impressive. And again, it's really hard to split some of the midfielders in this sort of range, but I've gone Elijah Hewitt, even over Ruben Jimby. 
All right, now that you've paused the video to write your comments about how biased I am, let's move on to uh, pick seven with Hawthorne. Originally, this was Cam McKenzie. I've got them taking Elijah Sardis. Elijah Sardis, again, I'm not trying to just pick on 2022 form. Uh, we do factor in their actual talent as well. And while Sardis only played four games and averaged 16 possessions, just because he didn't get that opportunity yet at AFL level, obviously, I think it was injury that held him back for a little while there. Doesn't mean his talent has dissipated, and I still think he's up there. He could easily go pick six instead of Elijah Hewitt. But the Hawks here didn't have access to Sardis in the real draft, so I've got them taking Sardis now. Then Geelong's on the board. Um, they originally took Jai Clark at this pick. I've got them taking someone else this time, Mateus Philippou from St. Kilda, who had a really, really good debut season. I think he played all all 24 games that St. Kilda played this year, which is a, a really handy start. He's obviously started his career as more of a, a marking half forward with potential to play in the midfield. He kicked 13 goals from the 24 games he did play and won a round eight Rising Star nomination. So I think the X factor here will appear to Geelong. This is a West Coast pick, uh, but I've got them bidding on Jasper Fletcher from the Brisbane Lions, which is a little bit earlier than he went. He went at pick 12 uh, to the Brisbane Lions. Again, this is one where I'm pretty sure Brisbane didn't have the points to match this in real life. I don't really care. Let's just put Jasper Fletcher on the board as the next available pick to the Brisbane Lions. He won a, a Rising Star nomination in round 19 and played in the grand final team for the Brisbane Lions. So that's a really big achievement. So I think that validates him moving up the board a few spots. So West Coast back on the board. Uh, originally, they took Ruben Jinby with this pick, but I have got the other big bolter in this particular draft in Josh Weddle. This might surprise people, might... Uh, you know, please Hawks fans who are probably salty that I have Cam McKenzie lower. But Josh Weddle, uh, originally he was taken at pick 18. He was uh, traded up by Hawthorne specifically to get him. He is a sort of originally an undersized key defender who's shown some genuine midfield ability and had a really good debut season for the Hawks. So I actually think he's the next best player available in this draft. Then St. Kilda back on the board. The boy they actually took at this pick was Mateus Philippou. He is currently unavailable, drafted by Geelong a few picks ago. So I've got them taking Carlton's Ollie Hollands, who had a pretty solid debut season. Again, like I said, it's pretty even the midfield talent here, but Hollands did show quite a bit at AFL level, and this is about where he was taken anyway. In fact, it's actually the same pick, but we have an extra bid in there. Now, Carlton, having missed out on Ollie Hollands, are on the board. I don't know if this is a specific need for him. It probably isn't, but I wanted to have Max Michelani around this range. So we'll get Adelaide matching a bid for Michelani here. He was one that, at pick 17 in last year's draft, I think that's what it was, Sydney bid on him. I thought that was early at the time, but he's come in and played a really, really good role as like a third tall defender for Adelaide, adding some run and carry. So what we see with Michelani is that his ceiling may not be that high, but you feel like he's not far off being a pretty good AFL player already. And that's why I've got him bolting up the rankings to uh, Adelaide's pick. And what I mean by that is uh, bolting up to match a bit at Carlton's pick. So 12th overall. Now, Carlton are finally on the board. This is at pick 13. Uh, this is a few picks after where it actually came because of some extra bids that I've got in there. Uh, but Carlton missed out on Ollie Holland, so they'll take Geelong's Jai Clark, who went at pick eight originally. Jai Clark, again, is going to be more of a slow burn one, um, but considering the even midfield talent, the fact that he just hasn't shown anything at AFL level to the same extent as the other draftees, sees them slide down a little bit. Don't forget, it was pretty even around this range. Then the Western Bulldogs are on the board with pick 14. I'm gonna keep it boring for this one. They took Jed Buzzlinger at the time, and considering their list needs for a key position defender, I'm gonna get them taking Jed Buzzlinger again. This is about the right range. He didn't play at AFL level this year, but he had a pretty solid year in the VFL from all reports. So I think this pick makes sense. Buzzlinger stays where he is. Then we've got West Coast's second selection. This was originally Elijah Hewitt, of course, not available at this pick now. Uh, I've got them taking Hawthorne's Cam McKenzie, who has slid down the rankings a little bit. Um, he had a pretty good season, 14 games, averaged about 13 disposals. Didn't win a Rising Star nomination, but I do think his blend of attributes has him ahead of some of the other guys that have also slid in this particular video. Then we've got the Melbourne Football Club. Again, I'm going to keep it boring here. They picked Matthew Jefferson, a young key forward um, at this pick, largely due to needs. They obviously have a pretty uh, obvious need for young key forwards, and uh, I've got them taking Matthew Jefferson again. I don't think he played a game this year, but based on needs, Jefferson around here, it would probably happen again. At pick 17, the Sydney Swans, they actually, uh, what they did in real life was bid on uh, Adelaide's Michael Annie, they bid on Harry Rouston, and then they traded the pick, uh, which became Josh Weddle. So they didn't really take this pick, but in this scenario, Ruben Jinby is on the board, and I'd say he's probably the next best available talent. Um, Eagles fans will probably be thinking I've picked him too late, and the rest of you thinking I peaked Hewitt too early. So I like to think this balances out a little bit. Um, he had a really good start to the year, round three rising star nomination. 
um, and played just about it. Well, he played literally every game he was selected for until round 17. Um, good, solid player. I just think the attributes of pretty much all the players ahead of him are what pushes them ahead of him. He averaged six tackles a game. Pretty good defensively minded midfielder. Uh, still has to work out the tools around becoming a good offensive midfielder, which is why I have him sliding a little bit. At PK team, we have Collingwood. Now, they took Ed Allen with this pick. This is where it's getting murky for the draft because we're kind of running out of players who really showed something in 2023. So balancing the players that are left with who they actually took in Ed Allen, who didn't debut this year, I'm going to say they just take Ed Allen again, to be honest. A lot of the players that went in the 20s and 30s are still uncapped and therefore haven't really done enough to make me change this pick. So Ed Allen back to the pies. I'll change this pick though. Sydney are back on the clock. In real life, they took Jacob Constanti a year ago. Again, call this Eagles bias. I cannot wait for the comment section on this video. But I've got them taking who I think is a better small forward slash midfielder option in Noah Long. Now, Noah Long went pick 58 in this year's draft, debuted round one. He played 19 games for the Eagles and came ninth in their best and fairest. And to be fair, the best and fairest was a bit of a mixed bag this year because, you know, all our best players miss most of the season. But still, there's obvious AFL traits there. And uh, therefore, I think he's shown more than Constanti at this point, I think he would go top 20 if the draft was redrafted today. And finally, uh, GWS, again, this one is going to be a boring one. Again, there isn't anyone really standing out to go ahead of the play they actually took at this pick, which was Darcy Jones. Now, Harry Ralston was bid on in the top 20 of this year's draft. I didn't quite have him being worthy of a bid in the first 19 picks. Therefore, GWS didn't have to match a bid. They can get him later in this draft. So I'll just got them doubling down and taking Darcy Jones out of WA. I didn't play a game this year, did his ACL, but on talent, let's be real, that's probably who they would take. Again, let's assume they don't know he's going to do his ACL, but regardless, Darcy Jones rounds out my top 20. So that's it. That, that's about 17 or 8 of those players have actually played at AFL level and shown something. Um, so there was a little bit of data there and then filling in the blanks uh, based on the players who didn't play or a longer term prospects as well. There's a couple of players that played games this year that come to mind, Lockie Cowan, Henry Hustwaite. I just don't know if I saw enough from those players to justify shaking up the rankings any more than that. But I welcome your criticisms in the comments below. I do like to think I'm not too West Coast biased. I'm sure it it creeps in every now and then, but I do actually think West Coast did particularly well in this draft. And um, there was a part of me that considered including Ryan Marrick this year because he was a mid-season 2023, which means he was eligible for 2022 and be around the range. But again, that would be me just making an assessment based on what I've seen. And I've naturally, I've watched Eagles players more than others. But I, as always, I do learn from the comments, guys. Let me know your thoughts um, and see if there's any players that I obviously miss, which there probably will be. But I appreciate you watching the channel anyway. Subscribe to it if you haven't already. And I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.